Hello, dear participants who join us online and offline here in the wonderful place in Kharkiv for the sixth round, sixth year of the Kharkiv Security Forum. And today we have like the last panel of this forum, the fourth panel, which will be an international panel in English because we have some international guests here in Kharkiv. And thank you guys for being here in such a, you know, it's of course easier days for Kharkiv than a year ago, but still, you know, war is still here. Russia is unfortunately 30 kilometers from us. Uh, and uh, our panel will be dedicated to journalism and uh, the work of the journalists, uh, the disinformation cases, and the work of the local producers, or more known as fixers in the community, how they work, what we do. So uh, me, myself, who will be moderating the session, uh, I have been working with the media for a year already. We founded a project called Ukraine Frontline Media Platform, and I have been to some uh, hot places of Ukraine, Russia, war, and work with more than 100 medias to help them work here in Ukraine. Uh, I also have Boris Shilagurov, who is the local producer for El Pace, the Spanish media. We also have Christian Segura, who has done a great job covering the uh, Russia-Ukraine war here for a year already, a person who has some wonderful photos with the president. So, like, we thank you for being with us. And we also have Adam Sibera from Czech Republic, who is the big expert on disinformation. And... Uh, you know, like, I would like, like, this will be a very free discussion where we can even sometimes maybe interrupt each other. So not like, you know, this boring, I'm speaking for five minutes. So let's, let, let's have a discussion. And uh, uh, the first, the first issue I would like to raise, you know, I have heard this from so many people in the West, uh, in the East even, that uh, Ukraine is doing rather well in the media. Ukraine is doing rather well, still being on the first pages of most of the media. And uh, there is still like good set of attention. Not, of course, the same as it was a one year ago, then every single thing was a sensation. But still we are like, we, we, are, we are trending and the topic is very important. Also, it is very important for which other elections are happening around because this is also an important topic for politicians who, who say how much support we send to Ukraine. And uh, I think I will start with Christian, who is, who is from the Spain, the big partner who gave us a lot of weapons and is still supporting us. And I heard that today in the Ramstein, Spain will announce yet another package of the, uh, of the defense, defense package. So, like, from your perspective, it's really, like, how people are still interested in what is happening here in Ukraine. And maybe, uh, like your piece of advice to Ukrainian officials and how to keep on gaining as much support as we are still gaining? Well, this is a, well, first of all, thank you for uh, inviting me to talk here. It is a pleasure. And I believe that it is very brave uh, to organize these uh, conferences here. Although, as you said, the situation is much better as uh, we saw one, one year ago. In Kharkiv. This is a topic, what you said, that um, I talked very recently with a very high uh, profile member of uh, your government. They told me that they have um, perceived since last summer a progressive decline mm -hmm. on the interest from um, foreign uh, readers, foreign audience, not only readers, but uh, TV or whatever, they have perceived a decline, a progressive decline on their um, interest and uh, connection with uh, what's happening here. I must say, uh, I'm, I would say I'm, I'm an expert not only in, in Spanish media, but also in, I speak German, I speak French, I, 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 I'm aware of what is happening in Europe and I can confirm that our rate of, uh, for example, the time that a reader spends in, um, in one article about Ukraine is less time than before. The hours that, for example, well, I work for a newspaper, uh, any big newspaper in Europe monitorize uh, checks every minute of what is happening, the people uh, clicking and visiting the websites. The news that are um, uh, talking about Ukraine are less time 
on the front and uh, the main home, the main uh, the main positions of our uh, websites. Not only El País, but other uh, newspapers. Why? Because if uh, half a year ago uh, a big story about Ukraine, a good report, or any mm, last uh, minute important. Uh, uh, information about Ukraine that was, I don't know, maybe five hours at, at the top of our uh, websites. Now, instead of five hours, maybe this information is um, uh, underscored for, I don't know, three hours. It's an example. The first, the first, it is clearly going down. Um, and uh, I'm concerned. I'm concerned not because of me, because, uh, to be honest, as a journalist, the less pressure you have from your bosses, the, the better you work. But I'm concerned about Ukraine, because you really need uh, support from your foreign allies. You really need them. And I will finish um, answering your second, uh, second part of your question. I, I, it is very hard for me to uh, recommend or to do say to the CSU, to the armed forces of Ukraine, what they should do, but in order to have more interest uh, from the people from Europe, at least from Europe, they should give more access to journalists, uh, because this is the way to better explain what is mm -hmm. happening here. Mm -hmm. We will talk about that. We will talk for sure. And Adam, I think it's mm -hmm. better to ask you because, uh, from what I know, your your background is in disinformation, and I would maybe better extend the question because uh, I have heard this also for several times that Ukraine, at least a year ago, has won an informational battle with Russia because no one was following the Russian agenda. Everyone was looking on what Zelensky was saying, what mm -hmm. Zeluzhny was saying. So, like, what made what what really made people from all around the world trust the Ukrainian agenda? What really worked? Well, I think the initial shock from the war, um, a majority of the world didn't expect it. They sort of left, lived in a limbo and wasn't paying enough attention to what was happening in Ukraine since 2014. And we're sort of demeaning all of what was going on in Donbass and Crimea and uh, they were sort of retreating towards uh, f uh, from the Russian narrative. The full-scale invasion was a big wake-up to, to the world and a big realization. But what I think where Ukraine is, uh, where Ukraine uh, was and is very strong, is uh, it comes from the disillusionment of what Russia is, which the full-scale invasion showed. And um, for instance, in Czech Republic and Slovakia, I'm talking about both countries, they're different, but a lot of the media, because it's a very similar language, uh, the, a lot of the media space is intertwined. And not only because it's a similar language and uh, we have a very common history together, but uh, also because a lot of the media platforms are owned by, uh, by the same people. But uh, the first two months, let's say, of the invasion, the disinformation platforms were sort of shy because the public support, especially with our experience with, you know, we, we know what uh, brotherly aid of Russia is from 1968. So there was a big wave of support and the public discussion wasn't as tainted by disinformation as, um, as, as it was prior to the war. And Ukraine showed or to sort of tear down this mask of Russia as as a someone who's trying to help, or as a as a, as a, um, uh, the common narrative is freeing Slavic people, you know. So uh, when these massacres in Bucha and uh, all these atrocities and war crimes came to came to life, uh, I mean came to light, the um, uh, the mask was torn down, and this public support became um, not just. Not just uh, solidarity with Ukraine, but also us, our our own statement of uh, of showing showing uh, our identity to Russia, and that this is this is uh, this is a piece of history that we wanted we uh, Eastern countries and Slavic countries especially we want this in the past. However, as uh, our colleague here was saying, unfortunately now the trend is I I'm afraid 
that the Western countries and uh, all the countries except for Ukraine are sort of getting used to the war, mm -hmm. which is very unfortunate. And um, this wave of this, there's this new wave of disinformation, which is now, you know, uh, the, the characteristic of disinformation, especially coming from Russia, is that it's very, it's very it, it evolves, it's very adaptive. Mm -hmm. So it examines the, the, um, the, the moods and atmosphere in those countries and adapts to them. And after the first two months, it started to become, the, the, um, the, the narrative started to not target the country specifically, but more, let's say, the aid from the countries towards Ukraine, and it started to undermine. And after six months of that, this builds, and uh, people are tired of seeing shocking information, mm -hmm. and they want the war to stop. You know, there, there are. Uh, it's uh, it's not just it's not just uh, being tired, but also being afraid, unfortunately. And this is what this information feeds on, and. Um, where I think Ukraine also, especially with uh, when from the previous panel we had in uh, documenting war crimes, this needs to go as public as possible to sort of um, return people into that initial state of shock and realize that the war is still going on, people are still dying, and disinformation is, or hybrid warfare beyond Ukraine is still very active. Uh, just a short personal story on what you have said. I have been to, to New York this mm -hmm. year to participate in some, some events and I met with some people from different European countries, to, from uh, African countries, from Asian countries. And one thing which really got me when I was like, I was talking all the time, you know, it was September, it was just like when the Kharkiv counteroffensive operation happened, so mm -hmm. the news were there, everyone was preparing for Kherson and I was like, Ukraine, Ukraine, Ukraine. And then one person turned to me from Australia, you know, why are you not asking us about which problems we have? And I was like, okay, which problems do you have? You know, my village, most probably in 60 years, will be drowned underwater because of the global heating. I'm like, okay, but people are dying in Ukraine today. No, no, you don't understand. My, my, my like, issue is more important than yours. And this is what really stuck me, that people... They really, of course, we, it's okay we are egoistic animals who think, mm -hmm. so, first of all, about ourselves. And I would like to continue one, one short very question to you. After, you said that Russian misinformation is really adapting mm -hmm. to the reality. So I've recently read somewhere, I'm not sure where exactly it was, but I heard that Russia is now even using artificial intelligence, yeah. ChatGPT, to yeah. adapt to its misinformation. Can you comment something on this? And is there any tactic on this? What, what should Ukraine really do? Ukraine, uh, okay, uh, from uh, on the beginning, from the, with the digital technologies, unfortunately in 21st century with uh, advancement of artificial intelligence and digital technologies, uh, it's becoming not just a political tool but also a business. So there's a lot of money involved and with money comes power. And a lot of people, um, or especially in Czech Republic where the media space and Slovakia where the media space is owned by people who in parallel make money on Russian gas, on Russian commodities. They open, uh, they open um, companies such as Home Credit in Russia and China which does consumer loans, small consumer loans, which is also an interesting topic because both countries like China and Russia control uh, substantial amounts of their populations through keeping them in debt. Uh, Timothy Snyder and Ed, uh, Edward Lucas write about this phenomenon where in Russia debt is used as a tool of co co coercion. And uh, these people right now are uh, the, the owners of these companies that happen to own a lot of the media space in Czech Republic. Um, they, uh, they are afraid right now to lose their grip on this media power mm -hmm. and uh, the money they make. So they have to they they have to sort of you know tighten the grip, and uh, that's why they that that's what I'm trying to say with uh, that disinformation is adaptive, it's not factual. It's very easy for disinformation to change because it doesn't have to respect the truth. Mm -hmm. It it feeds through digital technology on uh, big and big data 
on, uh, on moods in the society and creates a new story, a new narrative, which is, uh, you know, the war has been going on for a year. People are tired of it, as I, as, as I was say, saying, and they're afraid. So it's very easy for them to jump to a different story, which is beneficial to private interest, which the private interest benefits from, from Russia and China because that's where their money is based. I want to um, uh, just yeah, a brief, you know, sorry, um, brief words about what something he said about people being tired. Uh, I I can f perceive it uh, in Western Europe uh, from our readers, but also from the readers of other newspapers and and how I perceive it, because um, now the international community, for example of the Spanish-speaking language countries, not only them, also in France, they are paying more attention to, to a very, uh, in my, from my point of view, I'm not saying this as a journalist, uh, a very uh, incorrect points of view mm -hmm. that, for example, people like President of Brazil, Lula da Silva, or Gustavo Petro in Colombia have about uh, what's happening here. People is paying more attention to them when they say that, well, this war, it's 50-50 uh, responsibility between the United States and Russia. Um, from my point of view, and if we see the facts, this is absolutely nonsense. But people is being, is getting tired of mm -hmm. this war, so they try to look for yeah. other um, voices. And yeah. I'm not talking about uh, bots or uh, fake spread, spread, I don't know, fake um, news spread by Russian media, talking about uh, politicians and institutional representatives who are giving another um, another version, and this version, this this view of, the, of 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 what's happening here is mostly incorrect. But they are looking at it because they are tired of what is happening. Mm -hmm. So when someone tells them, look, this is. Uh, responsibility of the United States and Russia and this war must be over when, uh, I don't know, United States stops uh, delivering weapons to Ukraine. They're looking for an answer to say, okay, we are tired of this war and we want to listen other voices. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a, a, a problem uh, that I've seen as a journalist and an observer of what is happening right now. You know, like it's generally, I think the strategy of Russia to create several narratives at the same time, so that people they don't talk about what is exactly happening. Exactly. They're talking about something around what is happening. Mm. So this is what we have known for years. And uh, I would like ju just maybe to to jump to Boris for 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 sure. a very important asking, jumping out of our first topic. But uh, Boris is a local producer, which is you know a fixer. A fixer. We call it mostly. <coughs> But still, people, what like I see, they don't know what is this. They, they really, everyone sees what what Christian does because yeah, his name is on the top of the newspaper. But no one in Ukraine really a lot. I'm speaking about the general community knows about what is this job. So could you like jump maybe the audience? What what, what is your job? What are you doing, and why it's so important for a journalist <coughs> when he is in the country which is in the state of war to have a good fixer uh, well honestly fixers I would say at least 50% of fixers don't like the term in, uh, that we talked with you like, uh, earlier we don't like the term fixer to be used <laughs> but it is what it is we are not fixing plumps or anything uh, other than that um, I mean to be honest with you a lot of people didn't choose uh, to be fixers uh, last year, starting February, we became uh, local producers for a lot of medias uh, just because uh, uh, we had to help somehow. And basically, I gave a couple of interviews at first to like C4, Channel 4 British, BBC and someone else. And somehow I got contacts uh, uh, from different medias. They were asking me about your local, you know, roads. Uh, you didn't escape because, you know, a lot of people were out of town at this point of time. I would even say uh, maybe 85% of Kharkiv were not here anymore. 
So it was difficult to find a person who talks English, who knows roads, who knows people. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I even heard the joke that every second person in Kharkiv who knows English is a fixer right now. It's back in March. <laughs> that is true. That is that is true. Uh, <coughs> anyway, so we started to help uh, different medias and somehow, you know, work after work. So it started with like easy things like, uh, can you translate that, like this part of the interview? Can you go and translate us shortly what this person saying? So we can, after all, um, and make a material from this uh, and then you meet in new medias, medias with bigger access, with bigger names and they get in access to the front line and you're going through <coughs> shellings, some of us going through concussions, like me I didn't have it uh, and uh, you see how people are struggling, especially like military thematic, I don't know if, like for everyone else, but military thematic is more easier going for me than to see people struggle, kids uh, being in the places where they're not supposed to be because, you know, we are trying to evacuate everyone, but unfortunately it's some parents who uh, <clears throat> don't take much responsibility about uh, their child. So di difficult things. Um, but also you have pretty good contacts. You meet very interesting people, especially people who became soldiers, who've done a lot, who became very big volunteers. I know big organizations who helped a lot, our uh, guys in Bakhmut and uh, any other uh, city and uh, the occupation of Kherson. Mm -hmm. So, you know, being a fixer is you have to know and uh, be ready to do everything, at least little by little. But, but why it is important for a journalist to find a really good uh, local producer, fixer, while he's working especially in the war conditions? Maybe Christian can explain better, but from, from, my, from my point of view, yeah. Um, well, it's good to have a person who you can rely on. Mm -hmm. Especially when you're in different city, when you don't know the culture, because you know when it's all happened, there was a lot of journalists here, and they didn't know anyone. Mm -hmm. And I was, I don't know, maybe, I think I'm friendly, and maybe that's that's what helped me to make new friends, to have you know journalists feel comfortable with me, because uh, after all. I was uh, working also with New York Times, Washington Post. I became very good friends with some of them. We are still in touch. We are still talking. Uh, you know, it's good to have someone who understand you, especially when you're under stress, when you're under shelling, and someone who is right behind you when you have to understand what is going on, and you have no idea. And this guy behind you is saying, look, we're going to do this, this, and that, because that's what I heard. Let's do it. And we are safe, because, you know, it's some dangerous situation, then you have to react very fast. Uh, so, I think most, it's not knowing English, not knowing language. It's just, if you have a right person with you who, you know, can back you up, that's pretty much, I think, uh, most part of my job. I'm not a security, but I feel like it's little part of what I have to do. You know, after what Boris said, I think every single person in the room will feel like, oh my god, I need to have a fixer myself, whatever, <laughs> like, who will back me up, who will support me, who will be my friend. <laughs> but, like, I'm joking. Uh, getting back to this, you know, I really got but what sh uh, you, Christian, said that, and uh, you, Adam, that people in the West are tired of the war. But I wouldn't say that they're the only one to blame. I have lots of the friends inside Ukraine or Ukrainians outside mm -hmm. who are also tired and who are not following the news. And especially uh, if you see uh, Zelensky channel, who is, you know, his, his evening addresses is one of the most popular thing watched all around the world. And if you follow how many less viewers he had Every day, every single day, then this number goes down and goes down. In Telegram, you can in his Telegram channel. It really see, and especially first of all, the, the the content users are Ukrainians because this is the information for us first of all to consume, to hear from our president every day. 
even me myself, I'm not watching this every day, I'm just reading what, what they have said. And uh, in this matter, I know that you're from, you work for foreign media and you, you understand more what is happening in the foreign media, but the one problem I see personally is that Ukraine has not yet still found its own media which will be translating good, like, the, the, the knowledge outside, because Russia has Russia Today, Sputnik, all this... I, I don't want to use curse yeah, language. Pro -propaganda story, but, <coughs> all these uh, not media channels, but something, something. But they still have it. So, so uh, and maybe Ukraine should find some solution in setting up its own media. I don't know. But uh, what do you think about this idea? It sounds a bit crazy, but still. I I I would um, have a, a different approach. If you. Uh, Russia needs this, uh, I would not consider it media, but uh, uh, propaganda machines, because Russia is very much isolated, mm -hmm. especially in, uh, mm -hmm. in the Western world. Mm -hmm. It can be useful in, I don't know, Latin America, yes. Africa, I'm not, I don't know, but I know Latin America. But uh, the point is that Ukraine is not alone. I mean, the, the way to um, explain the struggle of Ukraine to the world is already here. There are, like uh, last time I talked with the uh, uh, press office of the, gener of, of the general staff of the armed forces of Ukraine, they told me that they had like 15,000 at the end of 2022, 15,000 uh, registered with press credentials, journalists, 8,000, 8, about most of 8,000 of people were foreigners. So you already have this. Um, do you need to create, do, does Ukraine need, for example, to have uh, its own BBC or, okay, or Deutsche Welle? Uh, why not? But um, right now, I think uh, you already have uh, huge support from uh, important media who are trying to explain what is happening here. In the future, e every country would like to have a BBC, you know? Oh, but uh, right now, I would suggest Ukraine to count on um, all the foreign newspapers, TVs, uh, radio broadcasters who are uh, in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I would maybe also add that I completely agree, but I would also add in um, the, the artificial intelligence factor, because a lot of the information or substantial amount of information we consume comes from social media, and social media are ran by algorithms and artificial intelligence. And with views dropping, that's a direct effect of popularity of a certain topic. And I hate to reduce the war in, uh, the war in Ukraine to a topic, but unfortunately that's how social media works. And uh, I saw a meme recently, which I think uh, works with this situation, is uh, that social media in 2023 um, they they uh, call out a lot of the Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian uh, themes for graphic violence or you know or or uh, um, or um, what's the what's the word for um, like content so sensitive, co contra content. sensitive content and controversial content and I saw a meme recently of a girl holding a Ukrainian flag and it, it was nothing else and you know this and it was like called out for <laughs> for controversial content. Unfortunately, a lot of the, a lot of the algorithms on social media suppress uh, news from Ukraine, and um, it, and, uh, in, and in parallel, that leads to a lot of the, a lot of the news going down. Unfortunately, and uh, since we live in the century we live in, and a lot of the information we consume comes from social media, this has direct effect on on uh, how it's amplified or in what intensity we see it. Mm -hmm. I really. When, when I would like to address a question to Boris because you said something that me as a foreigner was surprising that the, the, this decline of the in, people in Ukraine being um, uh, paying attention to the 
to the world. Mm -hmm. It's something that you Boris told me today about that, mm -hmm. that you found already, you perceive that uh, also among Ukrainians. Yeah, I, I can feel it uh, even here in Kharkiv. Oh. I can feel that interest is getting low. In Kharkiv? Even in Kharkiv. Oh my gosh. Okay. I really get touched about what you said, Christian, because I'm like, uh, I'm, I worked as a fixer for a <coughs> time, but I, I'm like mostly trying to, to explain to Ukrainian authorities that, guys, this media is here, work on them. They're my, m m most probably, this is one of the most important <coughs> tasks you should have in your daily agenda. Really, this is what, what you have said, this is what we are trying to push inside like the government agencies, the military agencies, that mm -hmm. media is really important. It's like, I don't know, maybe one plus story done by you will get Ukraine one plus ten. Or, I don't know, it's like, it's a very, of course, it's a very long way of how it, how it changes, but whatever we, we are telling everyone, and we also tell this to the local fixer community guys, your, it, on your, it depends the, the number of materials the journalist produces and the quality of materials he or she produces. And it's really important to get them really top real stories, if this is not, not even like this high top medias, of course, which everyone reads. But especially when it's, you know, some small media from, I don't know, Portugal. It's like, they're still here, they're working here, talk to them also. So, one thing I wanted to, to, to raise also, like, uh, of course, we all follow the news, what is happening with foreign journalists in Russia, with Russia taking the Wall Street Journal uh, journalists recently, and I know that lots of the media have taken their journalists out of Russia. So, like, I think you have been to other countries, Christian, and I've heard this from many journalists, that Ukraine is still much more open than others, especially in such conditions. Still, some things are lacking, but still we are very open, and you've said it, 8,000 foreign journalists have entered Ukraine in a year, which is generally a big number. Yeah. So could you please confirm to me or not, from your perspective, if, are we really open enough, at least, of course, we are not speaking right now about the military, let's speak about, let's not take the military topic, we will go to that uh, a bit sooner, but in the case of you coming here, you're not most probably suppressed on what you write. Uh, no one is following you for what you write. More, like no one will take you to the prison. We hope in Ukraine. Not they like, shouldn't. They shouldn't. <laughs> but still, you're easy to get to top people. You don't need to sit in a week for a current time to meet the president. So can you comment on this? Um, we are not talking about uh, military. No. We are not talking about front line. Let's do it like that. Uh, the openness of Ukraine is above many countries I can think about, really. Uh, I lived in, for example, China for years in my, of my life, it has nothing to do with China, of course, and the uh, access of, uh, the, the access I have to many organizations official, private, non, non, uh, any kind of uh, institution I try to contact, 90% uh, of them uh, give me what I requested. Uh, it means that uh, in this issue, Ukraine has done a great job because you are um, aware basically of two things that you can win, you can defend your country because you have these allies. And second, because you don't want to be part uh, of what Russia represents. You're heading towards uh, the European Union. And I can see that, at least from the way uh, Ukrainian institutions, society, groups, individuals uh, deal with my request, uh, I have no, no regrets. But I'm not talking about uh, uh, working with the military. I will Let's take that <laughs> forward. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, and uh, Boris, you are the one who are most of the time arranging the stories. And uh, like Christian said, ninety percent. Can you confirm this number, or maybe you are not telling something to Christian? I would say that with Christian is a bit uh, different because Christian uh, now learning Ukrainian also. And to be honest with you. Uh, can I say that that you are checking letters with me when you write them? I'm, I'm, I'm. I mean, uh, local producers as Boris uh, will find two kind of journalists: the ones that need everything done uh, by the fixer local, because they are like uh, we call it in. Uh, I don't know in English or in Ukrainian, but in Spain we say paracaidistas, parachuters. Mm -hmm. You know, someone that suddenly appears on a place for a few weeks and disappear. First. <laughs> I've been here for more than a year and I'm most of the contacts and requests I do it myself. Many times uh, he helps me to translate or correct and to call because I'm not still not fluent but I, okay I, I finished my intro sorry. Uh, but yes with other medias uh, uh, Sometimes it's very hard to get some officials uh, to make an interview with you if you are not, for example, New York Times or BBC. Uh, which, uh, and it's understandable, but not really helpful, because sometimes stories, like I had German people who came here for a um, documentary film, and to be honest with you, it was very hard to get accesses because uh, they were not really good known here. Uh, and they had a very good idea. Their movie was like, uh, would be. Unfortunately, um, uh, after some time, their theater uh, had to close. But the idea they had would show war from very uh, good perspective. After mm -hmm. this, uh, someone took this idea. It was a movie about our military ladies. <laughs> Ladies who are fighting, ladies who are press officers uh, and mm -hmm. volunteering. Uh, so, you know, uh, sometimes it just... Um, I understand that some medias have bigger budgets, uh, bigger reputation. Uh, bigger audience. Yeah, exactly. But sometimes uh, we are missing ideas of l like lower medias that are, you know can give us more uh, attention to mm -hmm. our to our problem. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, those medias are helping us sometimes even more than bigger ones. Mm -hmm. So we you know we have to respect everyone. It's all our allies, it's all our friends. It doesn't matter where they came from. We've met a lady from Thailand today, for example, who is also covering Ukraine. Uh, and uh, as I understood she is here just recently. Because I, yeah. I could see she just came. But she came. And it means a lot to me, for example. Especially when it was first three months, like I told you before. When people would come here in danger, under the shelling. And people would f like jump on the train and leave from here. But international people, people from Europe, North America, and any other countries, they would come in. Mm -hmm. So for me it was also weird. I used to live in the United States uh, for several years and I would never think that it would happen in my life. That I would see, you know, this situation happening this way. I think no one <laughs> has thought about this. Adam, I don't know mm -hmm. how much you are engaged with, with the Ukrainian authorities or <laughs> others, but uh, commenting on openness, you're, you're here with us, and like, uh, do you see really also this openness, and uh, especially, one more time, let's speak about how open Russia is to the media. I've heard some, like from people who have bureaus in both Moscow and Kiev that it's the big, big difference. So like. Uh, from your perspective on your work, do because you're not exactly in the media, what you can tell us? Uh, I think on the beginning of the war, uh, Ukrainian authorities did an excellent job in presenting the situation and what needs to be done. Unfortunately, because of the nature of the war and that there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of information embargo due to strategic re reasons, it becomes an enchanted circle because sometimes you just can't say things because mm -hmm. it's, it, it would be counterproductive. <coughs> 
And these are the points where Russian disinformation takes advantage of, and it comes in and see. For uh, for example, a perfect uh, example in Czech Republic, the in media space before the before the summer counter offensive, there was this narrative of you know. Uh, we have to stop supporting Ukraine because the, there's corruption and all the weapons are being gone and everything. And because there was information embargo and nothing was happening because Zosu was getting ready for the Kontranas, the counteroffensive, right? And up until then, where's all the weapons? Nothing is happening. And then there's a week of a counteroffensive and we can see, see, that's where the, all the weapons is. And you, you have an automatic, you know, response. But before it, there was this month of uh, silence from the Sioux, which was completely understandable. But unfortunately, in the media space, this, 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 these are the moments where it's, taking, where, it's, uh, where it's taken advantage by Russian uh, disinformation, Chinese disinformation, and it's sort of, you know, after the year, and longer this will get, this, this builds up, and it builds up uncertainty in people. And due to the other factors, such as be people being afraid and tired, people stop following up so closely. And this is what uh, unfortunately helps the Gerasimov doctrine, politics of chaos, because suddenly there are many, many uh, alternative, um, alternative projections of the situation, and people stop losing, start losing track. Mm -hmm. Commenting on what you said very, very fast. While Kharkiv counteroffensive, I was at the conference in Kyiv, it's mm -hmm. called the Arthur European Strategy, where all top politicians come, uh, some presidents, prime minister, they come there, they, they are there. And how the agenda was changing, because it was the days of the counteroffensive. Yeah. You, like, first day you come, the counteroffensive has started, the second day you come, we are already in Malaklia, third day we are already in Zoom. And from the topic, the first topic was like, sh should we not should we stop supporting Ukraine, we got to the topic in the end, will it mean for Ukraine the end of the war uh, if we get all the territories or should we destroy Russia? So, like, it's like very, very <laughs> short, very, very short. Like, yeah. But like how it, sh it was changing. And of course, you know, the biggest contributors to the attention of the media, I think, of course, in the armed forces of Ukraine because everyone is interested mm -hmm. in that. And getting to that, I know Christian <coughs> to talk on this, I've seen this. Uh, the military <coughs> openness. I know, of course, I've worked with both militaries, helping them arrange the media attention to what they're doing, and worked with both journalists, trying to cover uh, what the military is doing. I see the thing from both perspectives, but before I say anything, so we don't have any prejudice from my side, like, there are these new recent rules which were adopted by the uh, general command that we have uh, uh, red zones, which is totally no-go for journalists. We have yellow zones, which is you must be followed by the press officer to work somewhere. Especially in the first day when Mikolaev was in the yellow zone, everyone was like, what? And we have green zone, do whatever you want. So. What, how do you see, you, you worked with old rules, you see these new rules, uh, and also you now have new accreditation starting in May, which will last only half a year, and you need to reapply and reapply, which is causing bureaucracy. 15,000 accreditations once in a half a year. I don't know how crazy these people are who will be given these accreditations, but your comment on what we are doing, and uh, Maybe someone will hear this, and what what should we change? Because I know that no one likes these rules. I I I'm, I'm I'm I don't want to. I mean, it's just my opinion. I mean, um, and I don't have uh, I don't have to uh, rule and to lead an army to free a country of um, an invasion that is a barbaric invasion. So, from my point of view. I have worked with uh, different armies in the world. All armies are basically very close institutions, very close organizations. So it is uh, not an exception by the Ukrainian army. So that's true. But. Uh, there is one difference, and when you talk with, um, for example, when you talk with veterans from uh, 
wars led by the United States, Iraq, Afghanistan, they tell you that it was uh, easier to deal with uh, access, to, to be granted access to certain positions. But uh, I, I will say something to defend uh, the Ukrainian armed forces. Uh, here you are not fighting against um, uh, rebels or um, people with, uh, I don't know, just Kalashnikovs, I know. You are dealing with theoretically the second military power of the world. So, and they want to uh, eliminate, erase Ukraine as a state from the map. So I understand that there are many, many things that make the armed forces of Ukraine reluctant to have uh, uh, external uh, um, observers of what is happening. But I say this to defend what, uh, and trying to understand the position from, from the Ukrainian army. but. I've talked with uh, polit political representatives, representatives of the government, from the government, from the Ukrainian government, and they acknowledge me that they believe there is a problem uh, between uh, the civilian uh, Ukrainian power and the military power, and not all the military power. Probably the, there are more conservatives to give access uh, to journalists. And this access, to grant this access, is super, and I will say this, and I don't know how they can solve it, but this is extremely important for Ukraine, because uh, the support that Spain, uh, or France, or Germany, or even the United States provide to Ukraine, it will be because there is a majority of the population saying to our government, okay, you can do it. That's it. So if you suddenly uh, uh, create problems to the journalists to provide information, it can be, uh, it can uh, mean a very negative um, impact so mm -hmm. for the interests of Ukraine. And uh, this is super important to acknowledge this. And one more thing. Uh, sometimes, this is very short, uh, uh, have, do journalists have, how many journalists have committed mistakes in Ukraine? And when I say mistakes, for me, m they may not be mistakes, but they have not uh, respected the rules by the uh, armed forces of Ukraine. I, n myself, me, and Boris knows that, I've always respected the rules from the armed forces of Ukraine. And I'm sure that 90% of the journalists have done the same. So why to be so suspicious on what journalists do on the front line? Um, we are journalists, we will explain what we see, but uh, uh, we have proven that uh, we are not a threat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Boris, your, your short input. Uh, you know, we are a democratic country, as I know, so... Uh, they can, uh, even in their accreditations, it's a rules that wrote under the photo, for example, that they have access to any territory and uh, even if they need to be in a battle zone, uh, that's their decision to be there. So, I mean, I also respect all the rules, we are following them, we understand them. Uh, new rules is, uh, okay, okay, we will get used to it, but this way you're also making people to be snitching, like, uh, to be sneaking. Mm -hmm. You know, they will... Everyone have contacts now, anyway. All our friends are fighting. So, this way or other way, smart local producer, fixer, will find a way how to get access to the military, how to get access to see how tanks shooting, and all this kind of stuff. But we have to respect what people who are coming here are doing, and I agree, they need a bit more access, because that's the step they are willing to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I've heard so many stories from the military about that one mistake of a journalist is causing the whole brigade closing for media for half a year or, or more. 
because uh, the cost of this mistake can cost real human lives, Ukrainian soldiers. And there have been this. And maybe, like, one thing which I also see, that um, the Institute of Press Officers in Ukraine is, like, slightly... There are good press officers, really good, real superstars, but sometimes there are people who don't really understand the importance of their job. Because... They're just, they are filled with other tasks, not working with media, they're doing anything but not media. This is also one of the problems. Uh, yeah, you're They're also getting tired, they're also human beings, yes. and uh, as I know, because I talk with press officers, some of them are getting about 30, 40 phone calls per day, especially when it's very... Late in the night. And it's when it's a lot of attention to like some area, for example, Kupiansk or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, they get in like a lot of phone calls and you have to somehow arrange <laughs> everyone and then you also get in uh, journalists being sad because you cannot make just press tour individually. Mm -hmm. You have to take three, four groups and it doesn't work for media as uh, well because everyone course. looking for exclusive. Uh, so... We kind of talked uh, earlier, we, I mean, we didn't talk it like uh, in massively, but we thought about this, that fixers, local producers, uh, people who are already been experienced for at least a year, maybe we can be helpful for these press officers. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can talk, al also take some uh, their duties, responsibilities, yeah. some their duties, so they can do more general stuff. Okay. One thing I would like to add from my side, I'm not like I'm not in any position right now. I, I know the problems from both sides, and I know that both pro both sides have mistakes. But uh, one big problem which I see when I talk that these ten percent you have not mentioned, which well, are but I, I wanted to ask you examples because I'm sure it happened. I have examples. Oh yeah. Where like I will not say who it was. No, when don't, it don't was, mention but, who did that. But. One time I was working with a journalist in somewhere in Ukraine and we were advised by two checkpoints. Don't go straight. Don't go straight, it's forbidden. And then the last time, don't go straight. If you go, I will even shoot you in the, like, the, so your car is not going tire. In, in the tire. And he's still going. And I've asked him, okay. And it was like police checkpoints. I never asked him, have, have this happened in your country? It's a normal democratic country. It's a good country with the rule of law. And the policeman is saying to you, don't go there. Will you go? I said, oh, I don't know. And maybe, but, like, but why are you going here? So this is the things, the rules. This is the bad thing that we have the written rules. <coughs> like, for instance, I know that there was a big, uh, like, no, not talking in the journalist community, then some journalists sneaked into Kherson faster than others. Yeah, I so know. if if you <laughs> allow, and this is like a big, I think, thing that sometimes then, okay, Ukrainian authorities, if you let one journalist somewhere, which is forbidden, let everyone. So that no one will, or if, so like the rules must yeah. be, this is like the rule of yeah. law, which we have, like set the understandable rules from both sides. And respect them from both sides. If you break the rules, get the hell out of the country, your accreditation is taken from you, which is still okay because if you like disclose some military <coughs> real important information. But at the same time it should work another way. If you are somewhat somewhat have broken the rules, we've worked with journalists, okay, sorry man, we're changing your position. But of course it's hard, I know that it's very hard for people to work in these conditions, it's really hard, but I think that understandable rules will solve the issue. I think that the Southern Command, I must say, it has been probably the toughest to work with, not by me, but... And regarding what happened in Kherson, because I know a few of the people that were um, penalized, I was in Kherson back then, I didn't try uh, to uh, break the rules, but I think at that moment in Mikolai, Odessa, there were like, I'm not kidding, uh, seriously, more than 
more than 500 journalists waiting to, to, uh, to, to be enter, in her show. Yeah. <laughs> and as far as I know, maybe five teams of journalists <coughs> broke the law. Mm -hmm. Not the law, the rules by the Southern Command. Southern Command. So it was like, it's not even 10%. It's 1%. So it is, I think, uh, when a brigade or a, a regional command uh, decides to uh, introduce these uh, heavy rules, heavy forbidding rules, because someone committed a mistake and it penalized, it, uh, it, it goes against a vast majority of uh, other media who um, behaved properly, mm -hmm. you must think about it because uh, then you are uh, probably, uh, how to say, losing, uh, I'm trying to find the proper words. <laughs> the, com the, the confidence or the trust of a huge amount of media and journalists who are um, here explaining to the citizens of countries that are supporting you what's happening here. Mm -hmm. So if journalists are not able to be on the front line explaining to, for example, we we'll talk about Spain, uh, I, I need to explain. Uh, the readers of Spain, why, uh, I don't know, we provided 500 million euros in uh, military aid. Uh, no, I cannot do it because uh, uh, someone committed a mistake and mm -hmm. it, that, that's, uh, and I, uh, your point, I get your point and I, I respect it because I know a few, very few cases of <coughs> journalists who did not pay attention to mm. what uh, it was said on a checkpoint, and they ended being rescued by the armed forces of Ukraine because they were under Russian uh, shelling and uh, fire uh, shooting. So this is this is a. I understand the commander of that unit going to rescue this uh, journalist, saying, "Look, I'm I'm risking the life of my men to save you. Uh, you will probably be out of this country for a." For a while, you know, I understand. And most interesting, in the military accreditation, it is written, no one is taking responsibility yeah. for your security in life. It is written. So, but, but like at the same time, I know all the militaries who are saying to me, we are not taking you here because we are, a f we, we, we care. We, we, are are, we, we are responsible. We, we, we don't want <laughs> to take you like yes. that from there. <laughs> but that's not good for uh, freedom of journalism because uh, at the end, uh, at least... I'm a grown-up man, mm -hmm. and while I do not uh, put in risk a military operation, you know what I mean, uh, okay. why uh, should the army take care of me? I'm a grown-up man, I have a credential that says that uh, I'm a journalist accredited and I have the right to go to, the, to any combat zone if uh, myself or any journalist mm, do something or publish something that uh, is a threat for the national security, I have nothing to say. But if I just want to watch, understand the war, what war is, uh, it is a pity that um, it is um, that difficult. And that's the main, the main difference, basically, and I, I finish with... Mm -hmm. with it's that Ukraine needs uh, a lot of uh, international support. The United States, if they um, begin a war, they, they, they don't need anyone, you know? You need, really need uh, the support of uh, your, your allies because yeah. you are not only fighting for Ukraine, you are fighting for the values that uh, the European Union represents. So at, at, at the end, we are a we are a we are a coalition, a, a coalition of countries that uh, want to share a brotherhood. So, that's but only Ukrainians are fighting. Huh? But only Ukrainians are fighting. That's correct. Well, like we have international legion. It's not very yeah. big, but still, it's here. Yeah. 
Adam, I know it's like it was a very like professional inside yeah, discussion, yeah, no, and no, I don't no, know if I, everyone gets what we are talking. Yeah, no, about. I didn't want to join in too much because I'm not a journalist per se. But uh, as a correspondent or monitor, and uh, I've been here for an entire year and uh, following disinformation narratives, even the debate now, you know, do you actually believe uh, uh, Zusu will, uh, will manage to liberate Crimea? And I always say I, I do, because uh, it always worked out for me to believe Zusu. So <laughs> my, my, um, uh, to trust Zusu, it always worked out so far. And... Uh, I trust them with this as well, unfortunately. So I might be a little bit more on the other side, but if Zosu says don't go there, then to me it's it has valuable reason, and not just. Uh, and I don't see it as uh, as sort of uh, as uh, limiting liber uh, the um, the liberty of journalism, but also you know they're they're fighting an enemy and they're fighting an occupant force, then that's what they need to focus on. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. a very interesting point, sorry, like it's a very interesting point, because I have been, I should confess, as a fixer, I have been a bit like saying to journalists something else, because I trust the Sioux more, more than a journalist with, with whom I was working, because because I have lots of friends who are there, and I'm talking, okay, can we go now, can we go now, and like, uh, this is the thing, you know, like, the real, like, thing here, it depends, I think, on the fixer, who must understand these human tendencies, that when you're working with them, for instance, to see if they feel it's right to go right now, or take time and wait till we have a better chance to go. Definitely. And that's yeah. why there are lots of medias who can afford themselves to stay in Kramatorsk and in other places which are a bit farther from uh, front line, to wait, sit and wait for the story. I know what you're feeling because you want to cover everything, yeah. but at the same time, me as a Ukrainian, and I know what the armed forces, that sometimes they just, okay, let's not do this today. Because, as I have told you, one mistake is sometimes, I, I'm right in the middle of the situation right now, why I'm saying this, that one mistake is causing that the whole brigade is closed for the media for a very long time. Yes. And maybe because of that, because no one wants to make a mistake, because we're not talking about, I don't know, office job mistake when you, you maybe like, there is one million missing somewhere, mm -hmm. but still, if we are speaking about one human life of a Ukrainian soldier, and even one human life of the journalist, it's really, I think it's really, in this matter, sometimes more important than, like, okay, it's a very big topic to talk. But it's a super, in it's, it's what I said at the beginning of um, this uh, part of the debate, that I, the first thing I said is that I understand that the most important thing here right now is that there is a country trying to uh, defend itself mm -hmm. from a, a barbaric invasion. Mm -hmm. So coming from this understand, understanding, mm -hmm. I, I try to, to defend uh, our job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And okay. I, I completely understand. Boris that. is trying to <laughs> add something. I just to want to add times. a little thing that it's supposed to be from both sides, because uh, some of international people who comes here, it doesn't matter, journalists, correspondent, uh, experts, they've been through so many wars that they are so experienced that they know what they're going to see. Uh, but it's supposed to be also from the other side, like you said on checkpoints, our military who is staying there, who, is, who knows situation. Who will tell you like look it's dangerous here then you have to understand oh, yeah. what is going on but it has to be from both sides from yes. people who come in and for people you know, who a is public here. contract like, yeah it's not official yeah. but like let's say set up a public contract we'll all agree all parties to set of the rules you you want you break it you're out of the game but at the same time this mistake can cause a life and this is the biggest thing. That's but in what you have said, I really like to raise this because the name of our e panel is the, the change of the journalist practices. And you said a very interesting thing that journalists who come there are very experienced. They had experience in other war. But from what I have heard from so many people, like from maybe 10 plus journalists and 10 plus press officers, and everyone is saying this in one way. This war is nothing compared to any other wars. Because here we have, and you said this very right, Christian, two professional armies. One of them is yet the second power, military power, most probably in the world, 
fighting each other, with artillery not stopping 24 hours per 7, with aviation working, with so many things happening around. It's nothing compared to some, I don't know, guerrilla appraisals in, in another country when U.S. Army comes and, of course, destroys everyone because they have superpowers in that. So, like, and on this matter, like, talking about the journalism practices, uh, <coughs> of course, our world is crazy. <coughs> we all hope that this war will end soon, but we will have another war. And Ukraine, as it tends to be, is really willing, and the President Zelensky said, right, we want to create this United 24 platform, which is not fundraising platform, which is giving support in 24 hours. So how much the whole journalism, let's, begin, let's not focus on Ukraine, let's focus like the global journalism practice, has changed due to the war in Ukraine. What has changed for the media in the big scale? Hmm. Let's, not, like, let's jump out of the topic for a bit. Like, like let's imagine we are sitting somewhere in New York in Cozy Bar and discussing the philosophy of journalism. I don't know. That's a question to you guys. Uh. <laughs> I think this war is very specific that uh, it's getting, mm, let's say, the journalists, uh, the jour from the journalist point of view, the coverage is uh, from the Ukrainian side because Russia uses propaganda to cover their war. <laughs> so I think that's where this war is very specific. And um, how, from the Russian side, how it's tainted from that because. Uh, Ukrainian, uh, the Ukrainian side is the only one actually making an effort to show what's, what's real. The Russian side is trying to show the opposite, what's fake. Mm -hmm. uh, changes. I, I have three things in, in mind. The, I'm sorry to say that they are linked to, to the war. But they can be, uh, if we were in New York, and we were not talking about uh, the war, I would say this, uh, we were talking about other journalistic um, uh, subjects. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, Ukraine has uh, the, the coverage of the Ukrainian war has um, at least uh, uh, made clear three things for the, our our work. First, open sources. Mm -hmm. We are working a lot, not only analyst, war analyst, but uh, defense analyst, mm -hmm. but also journalists. We are mm -hmm. my newspapers all the day tracking information that comes from satellites or what whatsoever like as you know much better than me it it can be uh, this not only applied to to the ukrainian war but to many other uh, uh i don't know informations uh, natural catastrophes or whatever you i mean this is, is clearly um uh i think that um marked but what is happening during the coverage of the Ukrainian war we are now all media working on that with these resources the second one is um, uh, it's amazing I, I, I did two stories about that the huge amount of uh, documents visual documents that uh, soldiers are uh, posting mm -hmm. yeah. on social networks TikTok is my favorite one it's, it's, it's amazing how much, how many things I'm learning from, um, in terms of military, I don't know, tactics or weaponry or uh, reaction of the human, of, of, uh, the human behavior in, in certain situations. So this is clearly uh, another thing that n not appear here, but consolidated here as a resource for journalists that can be applied to other subjects. And the third one is that public officers, uh, military, politicians, they now uh, opted as the main way to uh, spread the information, social networks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's it. Uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, president of Ukraine, is the clear example that from now on, uh, if, uh, I don't know, uh, president wants to uh, share 
uh, his views, her views with the wall, yeah. he can do it on Telegram. Uh, he fact, can do it like this. Exactly, yes, exactly. he doesn't think like what I just wanted to ask you. Like, I think what has totally been that because of like in another way, press conferences. Because you see every single small politician in Ukraine. Remember the Tali Kim, who is like the the superstar of Telegram. We don't have these official press conferences, everyone sitting like this. <coughs> everyone is doing this. Fi yeah, 50 yeah. seconds address. Hi, guys, we are okay. Russians are bombing, but still we're okay. We will survive. Bye-bye. So this is something that changed our work. And to be honest, I'm, I'm not very fond of that. It helps mm. to be quoted on very uh, uh, urgent uh, breaking news, but uh, I still like... <laughs> Face to face and uh, still like uh, press conferences, mm -hmm. but it's also a part of coronavirus. Mm. All these interviews, yeah. and you remember how coronavirus disappeared in Ukraine starting February twenty fourth. <laughs> it has not it, really yes, disappeared. Yes, no, yes, yeah. no. There are well, some there are some developments in digital technologies that have been used in warfare for the first time in this war, such as deep fakes. I remember on the beginning of the war with the deep fake with Zelensky telling the so to hand down the weapons as well. Mm. That was a prime example of information warfare and how it develops and how this war changed it a lot. True. Yeah. yeah. And uh, of course, I think there are like lots of things, and especially in the, you know, I, I have some friends, they, they run totally digital media, which is totally a new way. They only have yeah. Telegram and Instagram and maybe TikTok. They don't even have a website. They don't need it. They just use this free. I'm talking about Svidomi. Mm -hmm. But they, 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 they have developed a website recently, but like for the most of the time, they were only totally Instagram media, mm -hmm. or like Kiev Independent, totally Twitter media. Everyone is yeah. reading Kiev Independent in, on yeah. Twitter. And this is, I think, also like one thing that uh, more, and I, I like, especially, I work with several radio medias, like radio outlets, and it was very interesting how like, I was introducing them to some politicians, oh, like, this is a radio, and they're like, mm, radio, so we will record. No, 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 we will take a photo of you, we will uh, take a video of you, because we are a digital media platform right now, we are not exactly a radio anymore. And this is also like a very interesting thing for me. I know that it has been changing, especially but uh, in the recent years, but I think in Ukraine this has like shown a lot. Okay, um, can, can we I are just, like... Uh, I, I wanted to add on that I completely agree with Christian that... Uh, too much uncoordinated information is not necessarily for the benefit of the humankind. Because mm. if you look with the development, uh, exactly how you were pointing at your phone. So we have this, uh, it's uh, in my brand of work, sort of a joke. Who would have thought that all the knowledge of the world put into a little box <laughs> would actually make us dumber, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's already philosophy. Okay, like, yeah. uh, we are, we are uh, shortly running out of time. And maybe I have not covered some topics you want to raise from your point. It's really important. I want you to make it like... Let's make it a closing remarks, but we have the chance to make some more interactions. What you really want to say to the audience, especially as we let's remind that, that this is the Kharkiv Security Forum. And for Kharkiv, uh, the city, which will be still a city 30 kilometers from Russia, of course, security is a very, very, very big issue for its future. So, uh, in this matter, maybe some closing remarks from all of you, and especially Boris, you are the Kharkiv. I am myself also from Kharkiv, by the way. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> like, uh, some, some on this view, uh, maybe I have not asked you something you want to add. Who, uh, who wants to start? Mm. It's your take. Well, I will begin. I, I just want to say that uh, it would be great if uh, Kharkiv can keep organizing a meeting like this one. Meetings that uh, can uh, bring together uh, people from all over the country, or maybe abroad, and especially uh, gatherings and activities that uh, uh, are attractive for um, journalists from, uh, for example, Spain. I mean, I truly believe that, believe that something like what you are organizing here today 
not could me. be <laughs> could be very very useful not only for the city but uh, for the for for journalism and yeah. for Ukraine yeah. thank, you. thank you thank you Adam if I'm I would I would maybe say uh, or uh, let's not uh, f for for me the most important thing is not to give up on the fight against disinformation because I believe that the quality of information is uh, directly linked to quality of society and democracy we live in so uh, not to you know it can be frustrating and it's a long fight but uh, to to be brave and uh, Mm, uh, what's the opposite of tired? <laughs> no, uh, to Active. constant, you know, energized. En energized, yeah. <laughs> well, to to just to constantly to not hide away from the fact that there is also hybrid warfare, not just the conventional one, and that our information space is under attack from two two big countries right now. And I'm talking about the Western information space, which I consider Ukraine part of. But uh, it's uh, to. I, I believe it's uh, it's quite essential to the development of democracy in 21st century. Uh, well, first of all, I want to appreciate uh, everybody who are coming here to help us, uh, all of our allies. Uh, I want to say that uh, Kharkiv cannot be Russian. Mm -hmm. Kharkiv will, n never, will never be never Russian. Be Russian. Mm -hmm. uh, I also want to say, <laughs> I want to say a lot of things, but I have to be sure. Um, we well, have time. <laughs> uh, war, war is still going on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we are uh, losing people every day. Uh, I want people to not forget that, uh, uh, especially what happened in the first two three months, uh, when everything started. Uh, we cannot forget what they've done to us. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know we have to fight uh, we know it's it's a big cost uh, but they started it yeah. and we are here we are pretending we are protecting we are protecting our land we have to be together and we cannot forget what is going on even yeah. in a peaceful time that's a very good thing, and I would like to a bit earlier end this panel, but if the moderator if the organizers let me, because we covered so many things, and from what you said, Boris, the last, especially in the set of journalism, I really hope that journalists will stay here after the victory to work with us closely on the investigation of the war crimes yeah. that Russia has done, because it's hard for me even to imagine how many work we will be doing in Mariupol, yeah. in Donetsk, which is occupied for nine years. And I really think that it's at some point important for us to, to be here for as long as it takes when all this ends. Let's hope it ends, but it will end one day and Ukraine will deliberate its whole territories with the help from European partners and with the help of the journalists and let's give them more access to what they need. But it's really important that uh, to think that, that the war, like for me personally, I don't know, and for many people I think, will not stop at the point where we liberate all the territories. The war will stop when we bring to justice all the people who have committed the yes. war crimes. And it's really important, and I think that journalism should play one of the biggest roles in these things. Because investigations and the information which you will gather, it will be really of the high, high importance for the people to know. Because I hear this a lot in the West that, yeah, Russians are not the ones to blame, it's only Putin's war. This is the big, big mistake I think the world is making right now because if we let people who have done war crimes disappear and just, well, hello, you have killed five of my kids, but like, still we are, we are peaceful. This should not happen. Mm -hmm. So, one more thing, okay? 
Of course, we have time. Uh, <laughs> just last thing, I don't uh, want any other European or other country to experience what we are going through here. And Never. as a lot of our military guys say, uh, if our allies will uh, let Russia conquer us, never will happen of course but uh, it will be their home it will be in Spain it will be in Poland it will be everywhere else we will just give them free hands to do whatever they want mm -hmm. and uh, there will be journalists here foreign journalists I mean not only because there will be research and investigation about uh, war crimes uh, but because uh, the future of Ukraine is the European Union. Of so course. All the way to the European Union, you will have here a lot of uh, reporting from other European Union countries. And I want to tell you, uh, because uh, I interview many experts on this issue, and the European Union will be tough on Ukraine. Yeah. Because we don't want, I say we because I'm a European Union citizen, but not, well, um, uh, European Union uh, move, uh, as you know, too fast to the east when we uh, integrated to, uh, they say, too early, most of the European Union, uh, Eastern European Union countries. So the European Union will be uh, tough on Ukraine. It means that um, journalists will be also reporting be, being um, uh, tough or maybe sometimes critics with European Union, uh, with Ukraine but this is good for the country because uh, many things will improve as um, I interviewed last December um, a very good American scholar Paul Danieri he's a historian and a researcher, of, a researcher uh, on uh, the Soviet Union and Ukraine and he told me mm, it is very good for Ukraine that uh, the European Union uh, and what uh, represents the European Union, this is also journalism, will do in Ukraine uh, after the war, will help Ukraine to improve and to become a real European Union country, a model, a role model that uh, move away from its uh, Russian Soviet past and uh, my personal opinion is that if uh, your country uh, prevails, and I think it will prevail, your society will be amazingly strong. So you will be a very important member of the European Union, as a really, really, really important member, because if you survive to what Russia said, did to you, then I think anything is possible. What else to can achieve. stop us? Yes. But journalists will be here and I'm sure that uh, the government and other institutions are aware that we will yeah. be also um, monitoring what happens here especially the money which you will give for rebuilding yes also <laughs> at some point and I hope uh, you will receive money from all over yeah. the European Union <laughs> okay on this big big thing uh, we are not only ending the panel we are honored to end the sixth edition of the Kharkiv Security Thank Forum Thank and you. thanks great Maidan monitoring team and for all the people who were today online and here in the room to, to, to joining us and let's hope that the next year we will have some I would say fancy event in a good hotel with not air strike alarms uh, <laughs> with a good after party which is, this is important there will be an after party right now <laughs> ah, but like I'm saying, big, a big, big, big uh, uh, after party. Uh, uh, <coughs> yeah, let, let's hope that this will work. In the thank next you, year. thank you, Denise. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Uh, it was a very insightful panel, and я перейду на українську мову. Нас є глядачі, які дивляться нас уже сім годин ноль чотири хвилин. Я хочу подякувати перед всім глядачам. Дайте я я хочу перед, перед всім подякувати нашим глядачам. Тут було дуже багато коментарів, а повірте, їх читали. 
генерала читала их тут тихо. Мы попробуем ответить на ваше питання, в том числе там были абсолютно серьезные питання про притягнення ответственности в каких-то отдельных местах. Дякую всей команде. А всем нашим гостям, которые сейчас тут и которые... А, а также дякую всем, кто будет это дивитися после, потому что мы все это, как всегда, нарежем на красивые шматки, выкладываем и на YouTube, и на Facebook. И будем показывать еще много лет.